Warning, if you're easily offended by bad words, fuck off and stop listening now. Or don't, either way. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Stamps.com, Allbirds, HelloFresh, and by the communication device for information warriors who don't want their entire digital history of lying recorded on their phone. The alternative fax machine. You could save $45 million or more by switching now. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hello, I'm the Wool Dasher Bizzle, and while I was created at the silence at the end of the first song before time caught its breath and the wind started to blow again, I can assure you that you did in fact evolve from filthy monkey men. Thursday. It's August 11th. And it's Ingersoll Day. Big ups to our favorite agnostic. Ooh. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from New York adjacent New Jersey and Ann Arbor, Michigan, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, Marjorie Taylor Greene brings hard solipsism to political philosophy. <laughs> the Christian furries continue their struggle against the Luciferies. <laughs> and we'll spend a night at the Creation Museum without getting to rub shit on any of the displays. <laughs> But first, the Elia tribe. One of the benefits of my job is that listeners do me the truly excellent service of curating the internet's stupid and presenting it to me on a pretty regular basis. And as I was considering what to write about this week, a piece of dumb came across my desk so brilliantly idiotic that I just had to talk to you about it. See, it was a post on Christian Reddit, in which the poster claimed that the word fundy is an anti-Christian slur, and that they, quote, would no longer engage with anyone who used a slur, just like if they had called a black person the N-word, end quote. And as I lay there on my office floor, crippled by the sheer dumb fuckery of what I had just heard, I knew what I wanted to talk to you about today. See, here's the thing about slurs. When you say that something is a slur, the word that comes to someone's mind is the N-word. I mean, yes, it's not the only slur, but it's the slur of such historical significance and contention that it's what you think of when someone says the word. When a black person hears that word, the unimaginable weight and history of racism falls directly on their ears in a way that white people literally can't conceptualize. And that is the problem. You see, because white people literally can't relate to a word representing hundreds of years of their slavery or a police state designed to murder them or racism against them that pervades society even today, when we hear a word as a slur, we think a slur means a word that hurts my feelings. More importantly, slurs represent something very different to white people in that it is almost exclusively a form of social power we don't have. We've all heard the various Uncle Franks in our lives wondering aloud why they can't say the N-word, but these rappers can. And that's asinine, but it's also indicative of one of whiteness's most dangerous aspects. That there's literally no form of power, no matter how minuscule, we'll tolerate not having. And when you combine this misunderstanding of what a slur is with a desire for the perceived power they bring you, you get white Christians making up slurs like Fundy. Now, maybe all this is old news to you, right? Christians have been finding shit to be offended and oppressed by since they were not being fed to lions in the Colosseum. But I know my audience and your empathetic people. Many of you, like me, had a lot of growing up to do over the years, and when someone tells you something's a slur, you're inclined to listen. Maybe you, like me, have been wrong about that kind of thing before. And 
After all, what could the harm be of being aware of someone else's feelings? Isn't it better to err on the side of caution than dismiss someone's hurt? Maybe. But maybe we shouldn't let Christians and anyone else who steps up to the plate with a made-up slur diminish the meaning and power of those words. Maybe a slur isn't something a person should be able to claim as a Hail Mary in an internet fight. Maybe a slur is a powerful earmark of history and pain that you and I should count our lucky stars we can't relate to rather than coming up with our own real quick to gain background in the pain Olympics that I gotta admit only white people seem to sign up for. And maybe if Christians like that poster on Reddit had to grapple with what it means when the things that hurt your feelings are just that, they might understand what I think is one of the hardest bits of social justice to get your head around. That social justice is not about personal discomfort or pain. That personal misfortune, no matter how bad, is not and cannot be the same as systematic inequality and should not be treated as such just because you'd like to be taken seriously. Look, there are times and places throughout history when it has been hard and even deadly to be a Christian. Nobody's denying that. There have been Christian slaves and Christian genocides, and the pain of those people is real and deserves empathy. But social justice, despite the fever nightmares of Ted Cruz, is not about the redistribution of power, and thus is not a breadline for white people to take their place in whenever they feel entitled to it. And this knowledge, this exclusion, it's uncomfortable. It feels bad. It stirs cognitive dissonance. Believe me, someone will write to me about this diatribe to tell me that I couldn't possibly understand what it was like to be a white guy the time they got the smallest ice cream cone at the water park. But it's a discomfort I think it's important white people learn to live with. Because if we do... Maybe we'd be a little more eager to solve the inequalities others face rather than focusing on how our own compare. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight is the smart, funny, and talented to my tall, Eli Bosnick. Eli, <laughs> you ready to, I don't know, toss me another adjective if you, if you got a second? Mm, needy? All right, we're going to take a quick break for just not crying. Nobody's going to be crying. We're just going to take a regular quick break for a our sponsor, Stamps.com. Hi, I'm Eli Bosnick. And I'm Heath Enright. You might be wondering just how we managed to convince our good buddy No Illusions to take a vacation this week. After all, you say, weren't his last three vacations him writing a book, having all his teeth removed, and having COVID? And to that we say, yes, yes, they were. And that's why last week, after we lulled him to sleep with... Eight Thorazine that we ground up in a hot pocket, we took apart his computer and microphones and mailed each piece along the route of his vacation this week. Wow, he that must have cost us a pretty penny. Not at all, actually, because we used Stamps.com. What's Stamps.com? Great question. Stamps.com gives you access to all the post office and UPS shipping services you need right from your computer and get discounts you can't find anywhere else like up to 30% off USPS rates and 86% off UPS. So distributing the pieces of Noah's workstation were easier than ever. All you need is your regular computer and printer. No special supplies or equipment. Plus, Stamps.com seamlessly works with Shopify, Amazon, Etsy, eBay, and more. You're up and running in minutes, printing official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send it. You can even order shipping supplies through Stamps.com, including free priority mail envelopes and boxes. So don't mail and ship the hard way. Sign up with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code SCATHING for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage, and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter the code SCATHING. All right, Heath, but isn't Noah going to be mad at us when he gets back? He is. He is. That's why I'm going on vacation the week after. Smart. Can I come? No. Beans. And we're back. In our lead story tonight, we have a follow-up on a story from a couple weeks ago about Bishop Lamore Whitehead, <laughs> who was robbed at gunpoint during a live stream of the service at his congregation on July 24th. According to his account, the thieves took about a million dollars worth of jewelry. A million dollars! A million dollars! 
And he happened to just be wearing a million dollars worth of jewelry at that exact moment, which is very unfortunate. He also posted a video on Instagram later that day saying that he told everyone in his congregation to get down when he saw three armed men enter the room. But <laughs> he forgot that when you're live streaming what happens to be a robbery, there's a video of the robbery. And he definitely didn't say get down to sure anyone. Sure didn't. Well, that very obvious lie that he got caught in, combined with reporters later digging up his very long history of criminal lying that he's been convicted for, and of course, the video of the robbery looking like Whitehead was somehow existing about 10 seconds into the future, <laughs> all that stuff has led to speculation that Whitehead knew the robbers were coming. Okay, to be fair, in the script they wrote together, he does say get down to everybody. <laughs> he just forgot his lines and all the excitement. So yeah, I can see what the mistake is. <laughs> like during this thing, it might as well have been like line. Got it. Uh, keep Honestly, going, keep going. if someone had called for line, it would not have been the least realistic <laughs> thing about this. We'll get to the least realistic thing about yeah, this will. robbery in a second. We will. Okay, but first, here's a little background on Whitehead that was recently uncovered by reporters after this incident. Starting in 2005, he ran a series of identity theft scams theft, and theft, stole theft. about $2 million. That eventually led to a conviction and five years in prison. While he was in prison, he got successfully sued by the victim of a $200,000 loan scam that he pulled off during his time as a mortgage broker. He also had multiple judgments against him in lawsuits by car companies and home builders for unpaid debts and bad checks. And during the incarceration, he also just happened to find God and Jesus. Huh. And God told him to start a prosperity gospel church, which it turns out is basically a tax exempt meeting place for fraud victims. <laughs> that includes one of his parishioners who was recovering from surgery and needed help getting a loan to buy a house. This was in 2020. Whitehead offered to help and she sent him her entire life savings of $90,000. <sighs> yeah, well, How she did not out? get a loan mm -mm. and she can't get the money back now. According to her lawsuit, which she has now filed, he's just keeping that money and he's claiming it was a donation to his campaign for Brooklyn Borough President. Uh, he got 1.4% of the vote in that 2021 <laughs> election, by the way. Side note, he lives in Paramus, New Jersey, in a house worth about $1.6 million. Okay, people, if an identity thief discovers your religious practice and thinks to himself, oh, fuck, this is way easier, it tells you something <laughs> about the nature of your religious practice, huh? Sure the fuck does. So... Just to be clear, yes, it's possible that he's not lying about the robbery on the live stream. I mean, a no. lot of things are possible. <laughs> <Yeah. Hilton. laughs> right. That's possible. But if you watch the video with your goddamn eyes, it's a lot less possible. The moment the robbers come through the door, we watch this. Whitehead immediately says, all right, all right, all right, all right, in response to nothing. And he yeah. lays down on the ground <laughs> in response to nothing yet. Like, he might as well say... you. You guys, you wanted me to lay down on the ground just like this, right? I feel like you were about to say that. You were line. Gonna, your line was <laughs> your line was to, to tell me to, to do that. And then, okay, yeah, no, I, I got it. I'm on it. And then, according to Whitehead, they came up to him and took a bunch of jewelry, including his bishop's ring and his bishop's chain. So <laughs> I didn't know those existed. Apparently, you wear that stuff over your bishop costume, so everyone knows you're the bishop because they can see your bishop chain. I don't know. But... He says they also took several other chains that he had underneath his robe. <laughs> I, I guess he just, he just wanted extra neck support that day, like a bunch of really heavy gold neck support. Just okay. bad luck to get robbed right then. Okay. And they, they've covered this, right? Okay. Assuming, allegedly, that this is fake. He's like, oh, here's my chain. Here's my ring. And then they do like an et cetera back and forth. Yeah, they just like <laughs> wave their hands. Yep. Where he's like, this is where the other things I will be claiming for stolen go. <laughs> yada, yada, yada. It's ridiculous. Also, one other detail here. His assistant pastor guy... We see this. He's just He's sitting in a chair in the side of the frame about five or ten feet away from the armed robbery that's happening. And this guy is looking medium bored with the whole thing. He's just <laughs> like, eh. 
Oh, uh, here's a new robbery. Well, you know what it is? He listens to this show and he knows that the stunt could have been hawking a loogie on his face or rubbing poop on his hands. So he's just grateful. <laughs> he's grateful for the church he's in. Okay, just one other thing. When asked by a reporter if the jewelry was insured, Whitehead refused to answer and he said, that's a legal question. Hippo violation. Which, that's a crazy response. The possible answers are, Yes or no, right? Or or maybe even I don't know would make some sense. But but objection hearsay <laughs> Latin word legal that's absurd. Overruled. <laughs> and it turns out the actual answer to was the jewelry insured is yes. According to Whitehead's lawyer who got asked about it later, the stolen items were at least partially insured. Again, okay, none of this proves anything. Whitehead could be lying or it's possible that he is a prosperity gospel preacher with a history of fraud who was not running a scam this one time. It's hard to say. Yeah, you, you never decide. know. We're skeptics. Skeptics. Open question. <laughs> and in Jewish question. And in minority <laughs> report news, GOP Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene didn't exactly quote Adolf Hitler last week. Not quite exactly. She didn't. She said something so incredibly similar it could be considered a paraphrase <laughs> that's but, correct but she didn't exactly quote hitler and the christian right is taking that as a win this week as midge tidge gidge once again proudly <laughs> okay that's fantastic midge tidge gidge yeah i'm calling her midge tidge gidge forever so okay. important yeah so she proudly proclaimed herself a christian nationalist and then this week added that most americans are too <laughs> okay well depending on how you define that she, she's off by at least a little, hopefully. Is, is she off by some something, some yeah. amount? Yeah. So this, That'd be great. Yeah, we hope so. So this statement comes in response to a popular meme that went around last week that replaced the Green Machine's words with Adolf Hitler's, right? Adolf Hitler's quote, we tolerate no one in our ranks who attacks the ideas of Christianity. Our movement is Christian. That's, That's weird. I thought Hitler was an atheist. I know, but right? People so always say Send that one to Uncle Frank. But again, Marjorie Taylor Greene didn't say that. Here's what she said and play a little game spot the difference. We need to be a party of nationalism. And I'm a Christian and I say it proudly. We should be Christian nationalists. I also call myself a Christian nationalist and that's not a bad word. That's actually a good thing, right? End quote. So as you can see, um, huge difference there. I, I literally think you read the exact same thing. In my head, that was <laughs> exactly the same quote. Okay, I will say this though. I mean, you know, say what you will about Hitler. Okay. At least he didn't have to see the Holocaust Museum to know it was different than vaccination rules. That thing <laughs> he did true. called the Holocaust was different, and he knew that. That is true. He actually relaxed vaccination rules, just for the record. <laughs> Hitler did that. Yeah. So it actually gets worse. When she was asked about her statements on the stage of Christian Nationalist Conference CPAC, Madge doubled down on her statement, saying, quote, when I said I'm a Christian nationalist, I have nothing to be ashamed of because that's what most Americans are. We're proud of our faith, end quote. Gross. And yeah, that's not what any of those words mean. But it's also important <laughs> to remember that she is deeply wrong about those numbers as well. Good. Right? As, okay, as, that's as good. As Hammett over at the Friendly Atheist blog points out, according to a recent Pew report, only about 10% of Americans identify as staunchly conservative and deeply loyal to Donald Trump. That number is still way too high. Sure and is. The number of people that were willing to vote for Trump again was terrifyingly higher. Yep. But it's definitely not anything close to the word most. Hell, Fair enough. It's not even most of Republicans. Yeah. OK. No, I see. I see what you're saying. But it is most of the Supreme Court. Mm. Now, they might not be big Trump supporters at this point, every single one of them. But they're definitely doing some Christian nationalism in their rulings. Those six. So. Yeah, okay, MTG, definitely wrong, but I'm just saying she's not wrong enough for me. I needed no. her to be off by, like, a couple orders of magnitude yeah, here. Yeah, much more wrong. Yeah. Hey, apropos of nothing, Heath, while Noah uh -huh. isn't here, do you remember yeah. how we defeated the Nazis? Was it, um, was it voting? Was it, the, <laughs> was it the voting of Dresden? Was it that the famous... Anyway, I don't know. We'll figure it out okay. some other time. Anyways, I bring up I feel story. like you and uh, Madge Tadge Gadge need to go to the Holocaust <laughs> Museum because those are different. But I get what you're saying. I would yes, love I to be alone in a museum with Marjorie Taylor Greene. I can say that on the record. <laughs> 
Anyway, I bring up this story for a couple of reasons. First of all, as you can tell, I have a lot of nicknames for Marjorie Taylor Greene. I had to get them out there. I had to clear the pipe. But it's also important to remember that people like her and those Supreme Court justices are creating a very public image of Christianity that the vast majority of Christians in this country not only disagree with, they abhor it. And I got news for you, podcast listener. These people aren't finding groovy liberal churches to run to. They're finding us, the atheist movement. Hopefully some of them, yeah. Yeah. And to MTG, I say, thank you for the recruitment drive. (laughs) We could use the numbers in the midterms. Yeah. Also, do you like Midge Tidge Gidge or Madge Tadge Gadge better? Ooh, I'm going to go with Midge Tidge Gidge because Madge makes me think of my pug. And Oh, yeah. I was using Madge for that purpose. Okay. Well, everybody let us know what you like better. And in Shamilton news. God, this is so good. This is amazing. A church in Texas directly stole the entire Hamilton musical and illegally staged their own production last week. And then they got caught. And then they got caught lying about how they're sorry for getting caught. Yep. Mm -hmm. And now they're desperately trying to hide every piece of video evidence whilst friendly atheist Hemant Mehta is gleefully publicizing every piece of video evidence because that's how the internet works. They might as well just have had a big wet grocery bag full of child porn burst open in front of the cops. (laughs) They're just (laughs) stuffing the Hamilton down there. They're eating it like it's coming down the line like Lucy and Ethel. You got got Hamilton in your mouth? (laughs) 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 So the culprit here is the Door McAllen Church in McAllen, Texas, And apparently they've been stealing shows for years without any consequences. And to make this particular theft even worse, they tried to shove a whole Christianity subplot into the Hamilton show. Into Hamilton? Their production, it was mostly a word-for-word theft of the original. But they also added a part where Alexander Hamilton gets saved by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. And of course, they had a pastor come on stage at the end to tell everyone, and this is almost exactly the quote, God can help you with the sin of homosexuality. Stop being gay. Okay. They use King George as an example of a gay guy. They turn him (laughs) straight at the end of the minute. They literally hunted through the script of Hamilton for the gayest character in hopes of proving their point. Yep. So based on the clips that Hemet managed to gather, They didn't even do a good job of stealing one of the most successful Broadway musicals of all time. No, they did not. And it looks like they actually had some relatively talented local actors and a pretty big budget. So all they had to do was use the stolen material. That's it. But they insisted on adding their stupid fucking God part. So you're in the middle of a brilliant score by Lin-Manuel Miranda. And then the whole thing grinds to a screeching halt. And you get... What some pastor added, which is like, also then, Jesus, I'm rapping, pleases. (laughs) Back to Linman Miranda. Very often negating the point, right? The the clip that's gone viral is him being like, and if I do throw away my shot, it won't matter because I'm saved in the light of Jesus Christ. And you can (laughs) see the other actors on stage being like, what? What? Why? That's the opposite of what this plays. It's fine. Also, also, sorry. We should point out that unlike Hamilton on Broadway, this cast had a lot more white people sure did. than is prescribed. Sure did. And let me tell you, podcast listener, white Hamilton hits exactly as wrong as you feel like it does. <laughs> so... Yeah, at some point after their first performance of White Hamilton, there were some Latino people, but yes, it was uh, pretty Wham- white. Hamilton, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> after their first performance of Hamilton, somebody noticed their, well, highly publicized stolen musical that they live streamed on YouTube, and reporter Howard Sherman wrote a story about it. That's when they went on their Eventbrite page and canceled the upcoming final performance because they got in trouble. But it turns out the church was also at that very moment circulating a message that said, yeah, we're still doing it. Just don't tell fucking Howard Sherman. Well, someone told fucking Howard Sherman and sent him a copy of the message that said, don't tell Howard Sherman. Here's what it, it said. Exactly. It said, great news. We're continuing with our showing tonight. 
you'll see the Eventbrite listing as canceled, but we are able to proceed. That's the end of the actual thing. We're big fat liars yeah. is what they didn't say. Just a quick announcement before the show. We're invisible. You can't see us, Howard <laughs> <Right>. Sherman. <laughs> So it turns out they did end up going ahead with that second performance. And then the next day, their head pastor claimed it was all totally legit because they got permission from, quote, the Hamilton team. <laughs> no, they did it. <laughs> Absolutely the not. Hamiltons spoke to us. <laughs> the Hamiltonians. We spoke with them. Get out of here. Well, according to them, a lawyer who a real lawyer, definitely real. The, the lawyer has a real name, got in touch with them and said it's all good. Um, yeah, so again, I think they're lying. I think they're liars. Yeah. Or, to be fair, or we live in a country where the owners of Hamilton would rather let their musical be stolen to help sell a bigotry lesson. They'd rather do that than deal with the blowback of telling a church, don't steal our thing. Or both. It's probably both. They <laughs> okay. must be lying. Look, there's absolutely no chance in the depths of the deepest hells that the infamously unavailable <laughs> Broadway musical <laughs> Hamilton opened up their copyright for the first time to a homophobic church. Absolutely not. It's not what happened. <laughs> that guy just walked out and he was like, I actually talked to Mr. Don't say Hamilton. Lawyer. <laughs> I don't know, you shouldn't have said Hamilton. The even. lawyer. <laughs> His name is Ham. Hamilton. Hamilton ESQ. Ham Hamilton? Nope. <laughs> Absolutely not. All right, we're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor, Allbirds. Hi, I'm Heath Enright, here to tell you about our next sponsor this week, Allbirds. And I hate them. So, sorry, Heath, did you say you hate our sponsor? Yes, yes I do. They have a mean, like, fairy thing as their mascot, and he turned me into a donkey. Yeah, that's true, he did. But Allbirds create shoes and clothing that are better for you and better for the planet using a revolutionary roster of premium natural materials, like their popular tree runner sneaker. Yeah, well, their mascot trapped me in a glade and then made a fairy queen fall in love with me while I was a donkey. I mean, like, okay, that part was pretty cool. Uh, the donkey part, though, that was not at all. Why is it called the tree runner, you ask? I did not ask that. I asked if I could trap him in a circle of salt before. Because it's made from eucalyptus tree fiber, a lightweight, breathable, and silky soft material, making the tree runner the perfect everyday shoe for getting the most out of sunny days. You don't hear what All I said. birds sent me, Eli, the host of this podcast, a pair to try, and they are my favorite new walking around shoe. They are light and breathable, plus they're way more stylish than what I usually wear. Then he trapped me in the past. Find your the new time dimension in the past for sunny days and upcoming travel at allbirds.com. That's A L L B I R D S dot com. Find his secret name and send him to the shade under the tall tree Heath. forever. I mean, I mean, buy the Allbirds shoes. The shoes, the shoes, are, they are actually really nice. They're, ni like they're the nice shoes. shoes. Yeah, no, it's true. The shoes are nice. Super comfy. And we're back. Uh, speaking of which, by the way, during that ad break, we did get permission to air Hamilton on the rest of this <laughs> podcast. Yeah, spoke to Mr. Ham Hamilton himself. Turns out he's just he's just giving it away this week. Um, give him a ring. We also own the Beatles. Yep, the Beatles. <laughs> and in Beaver Damnation news, we have a story about evangelical Christian furries. Hmm. Yeah. Kind of exciting. Just in case anyone's not familiar, the term furry means a person who's part of a subculture that's interested in anthropomorphic animals and often involves cosplay in costume as a furry animal, also known as a fursona. When you dress up, you're in your fursona. Sometimes, but not always, that includes furry-themed sexual activity, which is often called boinking. Also worth noting for context, Furry fandom happens to be a group that's very accepting of the LGBTQ community. Well, the Christian Furry Fellowship, or CFF, Get the fuck out is of a here. thing that exists. Yes, they are. They're a subgroup of furry fandom consisting of furries who also believe a genocidal ghost created the universe and that ghost hates gay people. And the CFF would like everyone to know that they're being unfairly persecuted for their faith. Okay. And I feel really bad for them. To be clear, they think Jesus wants people to dress up as foxes and fuck each other within the confines of straight <laughs> marriage only. 
That's that is ex- that must run through their head. Yes, correct. <laughs> so we learned about the plight of the Christian furry in a recent article from the Religion News Service. Several CFF leaders spoke about their very important problem that we should take very seriously. <laughs> they have to hide their personas from their church people and they have to hide their bigot faith from their furry people at the same time. Oh. All they're trying to do is infiltrate a very loving community and explain why a bunch of people in that community are going to burn in hell for all eternity. And it's really hard for them as Christians. According to one CFF organizer who has a red fox persona, quote, (laughs) my furry friendships are a blessing. And for that reason, I'm sad to see so much grief within the fandom that could be helped by the knowledge of the capitalized L Lord, end quote. Oh, you got cum all over your brand new fursuit, huh? Well, (laughs) brother, if I may offer a solution, (laughs) I'd love to tell you about a man. (laughs) Get the fuck out of here. Here's another example of a Christian furry being persecuted. It's so sad. He goes by the fursona Hund the Hound. Get the fuck out of here. And he started a YouTube channel to spread (gasps) the gospel within the furry community. His first ever video was called... Hund the Hound meets Jesus Christ. And it shows Hund the Hound fainting at his computer and having a vision of the Son of God who tells him about living a biblical lifestyle and saves him. In one of his first responses to that video in the comment section, someone wrote, what the fuck did I just watch? What the fuck did I just watch? (laughs) And Hund replied, my new channel introduction. And I guess that's not fair, uh, you know, because Hun the Hound is being persecuted. The evangelical Christian blue dog is being persecuted, and it's not fair. Oh, if he thinks that's bad, just wait till he makes one long enough to be featured on God Awful Movies, people. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. Come on, Hunt. We just need 30 <laughs> minutes. We could do 30. We can do 23, but we'd prefer 30 we minutes. We could introduce you to a guy named Matt Powell, perhaps. Oh, he does we do videos. a series of Hunt the Hounds. Maybe you team up. I'm, he's got a lot of videos, Heath, and Bella is on vacation here. for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the evangelical Christian furries... They're having a really difficult time, you guys. Take and it it's serious. important that somebody speaks up for them. And we like to be good allies for oppressed groups as much as we can here at the Scathing Atheist. So um, we'd all like to say, uh, go boink yourself. Boink your fucking <laughs> face. You're not oppressed. You're fucking fine. You know what solves everything here? Stop being Christian. Mm-hmm. That, and that could go at the end of every single headline we do. That solves everything. There you go. I'm sorry. I'm looking through the titles on these fucking... He has a baby! Oh, God! He, what? One of his videos is called Baby Tries on a Fursuit Head. Wait, hold on, hold on. The Sexy... person or the fursona hun the hound has a baby? The s- fursona hun... Well, the person and the both. 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 All right. Well, we just like started it. a new podcast, everybody. It's, it's going to be fun. It's called Get Fuck Out of Here. It's called Luciferies. <laughs> Oh, so good. All right. And finally tonight, in truly madly deeply news. God, this is uh this is a hard one. This is this is oh, hard. I, this is yeah. tough for us. Um, as you may already know, child preaching runder kid and former employee of the month here at Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC, Matt Powell was sadly devoured by his own asshole this week, and in a last desperate attempt at relevance that I can't help but blame myself for spewed a bunch of homophobic transphobic genocidal bullshit on his youtube channel very sad very disappointed matt you were the golden boy you were our golden boy you flew too close to the sun buddy and what did we always say what did we say we always said don't fly too close to the don't sun to the and sun. then say homophobic transphobic genocidal bullshit and get devoured by your own ass we said don't do that it's tragic it's tragic yeah so uh let me explain for those of you who don't know uh matt powell is a teen preaching sensation who first came across our desk when he (laughs) violated our copyright by putting out a video that was just us making fun of him for like a super (laughs) super duper long time just a long a long long (laughs) clip of us roasting him 
like an hour. Anyways, luckily, we here at Puzzle in a Thunderstorm are kind and benevolent. So instead of taking legal action over that copyright violation, we adopted Matt Powell as our own, promising him all the red vines he could eat and a race car bed. A race car bed, Matt. We were going to get you a race car bed. We did. We'd all go to the mall together. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd get a little zany in the photo booth, right? Right, but then serious. But then Zany again in the photo booth. I had a whole day planned. He did. He did, man. Asshole. He did. You ruined it. But then. You had a chance. Exactly. But then, tragedy struck. In an act of betrayal matched only by Judas's kiss to Jesus and The Rock not coming back for another Fast and the Furious movie, Matt Powell <laughs> took a job working for our arch enemy, Kent or Eric Hovind. I do not remember which one, <laughs> and I don't care to look it up. But he, I'm pretty sure <laughs> Eric is just shitty. Kent is the dad who's like multiple felonies and like I, I feel bad because one of them's just wrong and the other one super yeah. sucks. I think the kid's just dumb and wrong and then the dad's just like truly evil. But yeah. I, I cannot be asked to Google. I'm sorry. Absolutely not Google. Well, it's one or the other. Yeah. Kent Eric, worked who, for yeah, a Hovind. Yeah. Anyways, he did that and he disappeared from our public eye. Well, Sadly, it seems that while he was underground, he was brushing up on his hate speech because he emerged this week to deliver a YouTube sermon that is generously radical Christian terrorism and a, definitely a direct call to violence. Yeah. And if Matt Powell and his audience, if they were allowed to leave the house without permission from mom, I'd say it was incitement of imminent violence. And if the words you say are not protected by free speech in America... That's insane. You need to be in jail. Yeah. If you're not, your words aren't protected by our super broad version of free speech. You're fucking up, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big time. So I, I won't repeat most of the shit he said. It's nothing you haven't heard before. Gay people are pedophiles. They're recruiting the children. We should kill drag queens by firing squad. I'm not exaggerating. He actually says that. And then he concludes with a prayer for God to wipe out all the gay people. But my favorite bit is where he says, quote, if you're a homosexual, you can't multiply. The only way you can what? multiply is by molesting children and creating, like zombies, creating more child molesters, end quote. Wow. Okay, first of all, Matt, you're a pastor. Probably don't want to bring up child molesting as a thing. But more importantly, there's absolutely none scenario where Matt Powell does any breeding without some kind of like Stockholm Syndrome at play. Exactly. Absolutely yeah. not. Exactly. And while Matt may have talked himself out of a Christmas bonus, we've definitely been talked into putting 22 seconds on the clock. So, Heath, names <laughs> for the LGBTQ-themed zombie movie, go. Oh, uh, we're doing that pun. Puns aren't funny, man. Come on. All right. <laughs> Whatever. You go first. You, you uh, go first. All right. I'll take the easy one. 28 gays later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, why has it got to be Black Friday? <laughs> World it's War LGBT? It's, it's Black Friday is also a zombie. It's not very famous. God damn it. Uh, okay. Um, log cabin Republicans. Sure. Sure. Uh, train to Bussy on. What? Busan. Train to Busan. B Bussy? Bussy? I'll explain later. All right. Well, now I'm going to have to have Eli explain what a, a Bussy is <laughs> off the air. You got pictures, maybe? I do have pictures. Great. All right. Well, Eli, thanks as always. Looking forward to it. Jumanji. <laughs> and when we come back... We have some very important work from the oeuvre of cinematic auteur, Eric Hovind. But first, a quick word from our sponsor, HelloFresh. I gotta say, Heath, your idea for taking a vacation ourselves for this last ad was pretty sweet. This is an adorable little beach town we're in for the purpose of this sketch. Right? So, uh, what do you want to do for dinner? Oh, uh, yeah, let me see what's around. Um, checking my phone here. Oh. Uh, no bars. Oh. All right, well, I thought I saw a place called Tony's Crab Shack back in town. You want to go there? Ah, I checked there. It turns out that's just a gas station run by a crabby guy named Tony. Oh. Huh. All right. Well, why don't we try HelloFresh? America's number one meal kit? Impossible, say I. Actually, HelloFresh is a great way to eat on a budget, even on vacation. You just update your delivery address and enjoy HelloFresh at your vacation destination with just a click. Plans are flexible, so they work with your changing schedule. So you're telling me I could choose for more than 55 weekly options and take the stress out of meal planning and prepping while I travel? You sure can. From family-friendly to fit and wholesome, and even veggie, HelloFresh has tasty and nutritious meals sure to please everyone. 
I don't know, Heath. I'm on vacation. What if I want to get fancy? Well, then you should try Hello Custom. Swap out one protein or side for another, upgrade for a more luxe experience, or even add protein to a veggie meal. That means more choices, more variety, and more meals truly tailored to you and your family. I was a HelloFresh customer even before the sponsorship, and I still am. I love how they have gourmet options, as well as super simple 20-minute meals that I personally enjoy and I endorse. All right, Heath, I'm sold on making my summer extra delicious. Where do I sign up? Just go to HelloFresh.com slash scathing16 and use the code scathing16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and... Three free gifts. So I go to HelloFresh.com slash Scathing16, and I can use code Scathing16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts? That is correct. All right. So did you do that for this trip? Do we get HelloFresh? I did not do that, no. Oh. You want to go to the Crab Shack and buy all the chips? Yeah, let's, let's buy all the chips. Nice. Nice. Dibs on sour cream and onion. What? You can't even eat those. I know. I just want dibs, though. Come on. It's not often that I'm allowed to do intros on this podcast, but Noah's gone this week and Heath took a bathroom break, so I stole his chair and I'm officially the host of the show until the D segment. So Heath, welcome back to the show. What's up? Shenanigans. No, no, no. Fight me for that chair right now. Absolutely not. What did Noah say? He said no fighting to the death for his chair in his absence. In his absence, exactly. So did say that. now that my dreams have come true, what have we got for the folks at home to wrap up our show this week, Heath? Well, Eli, as regular listeners already know, over on our sister show, God Awful Movies, we review the worst that Christian cinema has to offer. However, not all Christian propagandists have the attention span for the required 63 or so minutes to get an Amazon Prime release, and that's why we've got a very special segment we like to call God Awful Minis. Ooh, you know how to do the echoey voice thing? Uh, sh- do you not? Do you not know how to do that? I do not know how to do that. So, what two short minis, for f- minis, minis. <laughs> minis. <laughs> <laughs> so, what two short for filmic stature video will we be breaking down today, Heath? We watched the highly requested, long-awaited Night at the Creation Museum. It's the story of a staunch atheist security guard in Kentucky mm-hmm. who gets converted to young earth creationism while taking a nap. And me, how bad no, no, was you, this you, movie? you don't have to do that. You can just tell us how bad it is. I got it. I got it. How bad was this mini? Me? Thank okay. you. Me? It was yep. bad. Thank you. Smooth. Go. Nailed it. Done. Cool. Yep. I really miss Noah. Yeah. It's a three-hander. <laughs> <All right>. So... <laughs> We're going to start this mini with a really long intro showing the inside of this creation museum. But the music is pretty sure we're seeing the inside of an like an old timey widget factory. Yeah, I went went with in in Santa's workshop. Nobody wants a union. (laughs) Also, can I just say this museum has a lot of mobility scooters. Like a lot. Don't get me wrong. Like I love accessibility, but the the uh, the sheer amount of mobility scooters we see in this opening shot is breathtaking. It's aggressive. It's like they give them out like bowling shoes. Mm-hmm. You know, like every single person is getting one of those things. It's there, a giant line. There's a reasonable argument to be made that the Creation Museum is mostly mobility scooters. <laughs> So, yeah, we see the front of this creation museum. We also see the main character. It's a, a, the new security guard at the creation museum. He pulls up to the place in a uh, a late model Camaro. He's a security guard who is very well compensated yep. at his other jobs, I guess. He's got, seriously, it's it's yellow and black. It's, it's Bumblebee. He's driving Bumblebee, like that exact Camaro or really close to it. Yeah. So that was confusing. Anyway, he walks in past <laughs> the giant line of rascal scooters and he meets Jim, his boss at the museum. Okay. So I, I, I had to do some digging to figure this out. Apparently, in the Creation Museum, the fact that this guy Jim is relatively tall is like 
a big joke that they do in a bunch of their videos. I literally only learned this because other people who have reviewed Night at the Creation Museum were like, yeah, I've watched a bunch of their shit. They all talk about how tall Jim is. Jim is like 6'2". Jim is not like 97 feet tall. But that's why none of this no. opening makes sense is it's supposed to be about how tall Jim is, but we don't get the joke. They're introducing their Carl the Puck of Pegacorn. <laughs> What? You know how they shoot it weird so that it looks like Derek's super short and Jim's super tall? Oh, that's From the weird classic. angle? Okay, and so you're saying this guy Jim is not a really talented actor, but in <laughs> fact, this a real guy who works no, he's in the in inside industry. Yeah, believe it or not. Okay. Not, not an equity showcase this particular point. Okay. I also like that, uh, so Derek is the name of the security guard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is played by Eric Hovind. He needed a character name that rhymes with his real name <laughs> to understand what was happening on set. Sure. And um, then Jim, the boss, is like, hey, so um, why don't you tell me about yourself as we walk in? And we get the saddest thing right away. <laughs> he asks him, hey, you know, uh, what, what's your life all about? And Derek is like, I'm separated from my wife. I barely see my son, so I moved close enough that I get to see him. Once in a while, and also God is dead, I'm an atheist. And that's our introduction to Derek's character. I honestly wanted Jim to be like, I was just making small talk. Those are the exits. All right, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> also, can, can I just say, they walk Derek around here and show him all the entrances and exits and what his job is. I feel like Night at the Creation Museum didn't know the risk they were putting themselves in by outlining their entire security detail for me, Eli Fosnick. I just want to throw that out there. Legally, oh. not. Do you want to? You want to do a little job on the creation? Oh, wanna... I want to do a job on the creation. Museum. I will so... drop in on a rope any time you want. Drop in on a rope of my own semen. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing: if you, I think I can say this legally. Andrew, get okay. in the time machine and stop me if I can't. Interesting. If you on anything in the creation museum, they'll probably shut down the whole museum forever. <laughs> Like, they don't have the emotional preparedness for that. I think that's accurate, and I don't think they're... They, you can't be breaking... You said if. if. You're just saying And I'm not saying one, you should. I'm if not somebody, saying not should. us, if a person did that, they would have to shut down. I think you probably shouldn't. I think in most scenarios... And I'm, I'm not afraid to say this. Did you say most? Of, most scenarios, you shouldn't... On the creation okay, museum. Okay, uh, our official position is all, but that's just a true thing that if one did, I feel like they'd have to shut down. I exactly. Think that's, that's fair. Hypothetically. Okay. So, <laughs> they finish their weird conversation and they get to his desk. This is the security desk where Derek's going to be working. Jim explains like, okay, so there's a list right here that describes your job. It's be at this desk and don't sleep. So that's like the <laughs> entire job. So Jim finally leaves for the night. And Derek starts looking at stuff. <laughs> My favorite part is not Derek. Eric Hovind, the real person, very clearly got distracted by the the clicker thing in real life. The oh clicker my God, that would like keep so track good. of the little keep track of people, people clicker. coming in, like the umpire might have for balls and strikes, but like you know for people coming to the museum. Yeah. And can we just say this is a thirty minute short movie? I would say a solid five is just Eric Hovind, like, playing with the loudspeaker at the Creation Museum as much as he always wanted. One might argue that the reason for this movie is Eric Hovind wanted to mess with the loudspeaker at the Creation Museum. <laughs> okay, well, they probably should have just kept doing that because from there... He walks through the Creation Museum and we see some of the stuff on the goddamn walls of this place. Here's a few of the things that we see just in one little clip. All the sentences on the wall of the Creation Museum are a great way to get me to block you on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, here's four examples that I actually wrote down that I saw in one hallway okay. right next to each other. Yeah. It said, are humans and apes related? Stupid question. But if you ask me that, <laughs> yep, you have to go away. Yeah. Was there a global flood? Also wow. stupid question. Did dinosaurs and humans coexist? The stupidest question. No, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> the very next thing on the wall, literally exactly these words, are human races equal? Ooh. Question mark. <laughs> Yikes. Ha okay. Ballpark. Heathleton. Look into your heart. How many people are disappointed by the answer at the Creation <laughs> Museum? All, knowing their audience, some, right? right? Yeah, we'll get to it. The Creation Museum will try to explain why, like, 
they have an answer to that that's not <laughs> racist. But yeah, definitely some people are like, oh, I was expecting like a nice supremacist answer to that, <laughs> which they don't get. No. It's a really bad answer still. We'll get there. Yeah. We also passed something where <laughs> this is their thing. This is Ken Ham's thing. There's something called observational science. Science is what that's called. And then his version of science called historical science, which is yeah. different because it's older. So you can't have the same science rules now <laughs> when you're talking about old stuff. So he's not wrong when he says the entire universe is 6,000 years old. Yeah. If, you, if you're wondering where you've heard the term historical science before, it was um, as Bill Nye the science guy was pile driving Ken Ham into the floor of that creation auditorium. Oh, yeah. There's a great video. The very next video when I watched this was Bill Nye going through right. the art park with Ken Ham. <laughs> it was kind of fun. He shouldn't have debated him, though. That was dumb. No, it was a bad idea. Okay, so from there, from the are all races equal and can we do science differently now because the rules are different. What's your definition of science? What do you, what do you mean science? Yeah, <laughs> after that little part, Eric, the security guard, sees Adam and Eve and he's just like, two naked people. Huh. <laughs> so... He's, he's naming the stuff he sees out loud to himself as he walks through the museum. And he passes some more naked people, and he's like, more naked people. And that was Adam and Eve at, like, a water park in that, that has a sex grotto, like an adult-themed water park, I guess? <laughs> is that part of Eden in the that's, bottle? That's certainly what he thinks it is. He's like, oh, okay, so it's like a kink museum. Oh, I thought this place was lame. Nice. They got a, they got a <laughs> fuck tub. I got to check that out later. Okay. Kind of piqued my interest, I gotta be honest. Then we get to what we were talking about before. He comes back to the sign that says, are all the human races equal? Mm -hmm. And he stops. And we watch him be like, wait, are, are they equal? <laughs> so here's the explanation from the Creation Museum, as far as I understand it. They're saying that like in evolution theory, different races evolved. But in creationism theory, we're all white, you're a bigot. <laughs> yeah. Is that their answer? To be clear, what they haven't written on the plaque is the racist evolutionist wants you to believe that all the races are different. But one race just got died because a guy misbehaved on the ark, everybody. Relax. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But that's what they're saying. We all started as Adam and Eve, who were, of course, <laughs> Caucasian people. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's less racist because it's not different races <laughs> that right. are better or worse than their head. Exactly, yeah. Wow, okay. So he walks past that finally. He gets back to his desk and he plays with the PA system some more. Yep, we get some more bits. And okay, I, I was never more angry during this stupid fucking movie than right now. I, even more so than just a moment ago when they were like maybe ranking races unironically. I would say this is a best worst if we were going to do best worst. Sure. Best worst letting... Eric Hovind do some improv because <laughs> he gets on the PA system and he does the opposite of improv. He does movie quotes, but he does the opposite of improv wrong. He get he says, you killed my father. Prepare to die. Luke, I am your father. <laughs> so he conflated the princess bride and Empire Strikes Back yes. and he got Empire wrong. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing that either he hasn't seen those movies, right, because he's a crazy Christian and hasn't been allowed to see anything mainstream, or he thinks those lines are from the same movie. <laughs> I, was, I was really mad. I stopped it here, and I was as angry as I've been, yes. And then he decides, all right, I'm going to take a nap because, you know, I'm here for the whole night, whatever, nobody's here. And he says to himself, napping doesn't count as sleeping, and Jim told me not to sleep. Napping doesn't count. That's crazy. That's right? insane. That's just a crazy right. person. Okay. This, this, he has a head injury. This character now has like a, okay. <laughs> a grievous head injury. The backstory is filling in. So he does take a nap for a second here. And then there's a loud noise and he wakes up from the nap. Or does he? Okay, good question. You, you want to just go ahead and spoil it? He's in a dream now. <laughs> I. Yeah. You know what? I do feel comfortable spoiling Night of the Creation Museum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For anyone so, holding out, I'm sorry I ruined your experience of yeah. Eric Hovind's 30-minute YouTube video. Apologies all around. Yeah, He's exactly. in a dream now. 
so he gets up from his desk and there's a washing machine sound that he mm-hmm. follows. Yep. But it turns out that's just <laughs> that's just what the movie decided was good music to describe musically fake evolution, I guess, because that's what he's going to look at now, some exhibits, and he's going to become a believer in Christianity eventually and no longer an atheist. Yeah, but he starts atheist. To be clear, the rest of this movie will be him stumbling around the Creation Museum, being scared by the exhibits at the museum they want you to come visit. Yeah, he actually pop scares himself several times here with the bug displays. He does, yeah. But that's, that's not how pop scares work. Mm-hmm. So he's just like a bug display in front of him and he runs all the way up to it even closer and puts his face next to it. We watch him pop scare himself. It's so stupid. Okay. Well, from there, we have to talk about the Holocaust section, do we not? The problem of evil section of the Creation Museum. Yeah. And they slow roll it, which kind of makes it worse because, yeah, it is the problem of evil section, which is dumb enough, but... All we see at first is that they have a Holocaust section in their creation museum. In their creation museum. But yeah, he he wanders up to that, and this is where Jim reappears, and Jim is like, hey, you checking out our super problematic problem of evil (laughs) section of our children's (laughs) creation museum? And he's like, yeah, man, why the fuck would you Christians bring up things like 9-11 and the Holocaust? And he's like, oh, um, we blame all these things on evolution. And then Eric's like, Okay, but you also have a picture of a lady doing heroin. And he's like, yeah, we just kind of took the pictures we could find. (laughs) Okay, but just to be clear, evolution happened on God's watch if Jim, the Christian guy at the Creation Museum, is saying evolution is at fault. So they have a section about the intelligent design master plan that includes the Holocaust and 9-11 and heroin use. Yeah. Okay. And then literally because like they both pause for a minute like, well, those weren't very good answers. So Jim snaps <laughs> and they teleport to a different argument. Yeah. So Jim snaps and they teleport from there to the monkey display with Lucy, the, I don't know, what, what like 3.2 million year old fossil that we found in 1974 of an early hominin. The not missing link. Yeah. Right. So let's be clear what the point right. he's trying to make with this moment is. He's like, you know. Lucy was actually just a monkey, not a whatever they think she is. And she doesn't, they didn't find any foot bones with her, but they put human feet on her as though the fucking scientists at wherever they keep Lucy were just like, <laughs> I don't know. I think it fits us better if she's like half fish and half men. You know, you know what? Let's do human feet. Let's do I did Donkey feet. Kong feet. Should, oh, no. Our narrative, it's better if we do human feet. Just plain old, normal, modern human feet. Obviously, not, not what they actually did. Also, I think it's just that we didn't have the whole skeleton yeah, fossilized. Exactly. We had like 40% of it. So we like made a ballpark estimate and we were correct right. because we found other ones since 1974 of that approximate yes. thing. He yeah. acts as though it was an aesthetic choice. Like we just tossed monkeys on there. And and to prove that, by the way, right next to the monkey, he's got an exhibit where he's like, I mean, if you take a monkey skull, you can make pretty much anything you want. If you think about it, that's an exhibit at their museum. Then an exhibit at their museum is you can make a <laughs> monkey skull look like whatever you want it to look like. Ape, person, Decepticon. It's all just art. And that's no, but like seriously, they have like the same skull dressed up in like different types of fur but then one like a person with human eyes it's so dumb so from there to bolster his point jim takes derek to an exhibit about racist old-timey zoos from way back in the day where they put people in cages because they thought those people looked like early hominids and that's true but just Super duper irrelevant. Also, yeah, not science. And for some reason, they point that out in the movie, right? Eric Hovind is like, yeah, no, that's that was bad, but that that has no reflection on the truth of evolution, does it? And Jim's like, fuck, let's go to the planetarium. Let's you know what? I, I have I have a question about stars. Uh, you, you got me on that one, but st- what about stars? <laughs> Shit, I lost an argument in my own movie that I made for some reason. <laughs> Yeah, so from there, they teleport to the planetarium section of the Creation Museum. And can I say, look, it is hard to feel empathetic for anybody in this movie. But you know who I do feel empathetic for? Who's that? Planetarium guy. (laughs) Oh, you you like planetarium guy? Because planetarium guy has the, the most obvious lies 
to try this film. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Look, the whole like we don't know about monkeys and blah, 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 like we, they just do God of the Gap shit, right? Fucking, sure. they're like, yeah, you can make a monkey skull look like anything. This guy's like, now you might be wondering, aren't the basic mathematical principles of the universe true? Let me tell you, maybe the speed of light is wrong. Okay. Or, <laughs> or that's not the, exaggeration. He offers us two options: the speed of light is wrong, or the speed of light is changing. Imagine that being your job. Imagine that being your job. Okay. Alex uh, joins us. Alex Jones's lawyers got nothing on the guy <laughs> who's like, maybe the speed of light is wrong. <laughs> This guy has a cell phone with texts being like, I have to try to fucking explain that the speed of light is moving around sometimes. That's my job today. So, But he literally says that. He's like, so, Eric, the atheist, for now, you're probably wondering how light could go billions of light years in 6,000 years. And I was like, sure am. Yeah, I would like to know that too. I am. And he actually says the speed of light used to be Probably super fast then. Faster. And so it makes sense now. Please don't do any math. He also Please. Points, <laughs> he also points out that light years, those aren't units of time. They're units of distance. And Eric, the security guard, is like, oh, right. But like, what do they think a speed is made of? Speed is <laughs> distance over time. So like, that's... It's what those things you know are. Han shot first in the first Star Wars movie. <laughs> if I say enough true things after the thing I believe, will you believe that they're related and let me go? Okay, just to be clear, yes, some science, theoretical physicists have proposed the idea. There's this thing called the horizon problem, and they've proposed the idea that maybe at the very beginning of the universe, light was faster. None of those theoretical physicists are saying that the universe happened 6,000 years ago and the fast light from then explains everything. One of None the, of them are saying that. Well, one of the only things I think we could get all of those scientists to agree on is that it wasn't God the wizard. <laughs> right. Their narrative, the creationist narrative, is God w thought to himself, Okay, they're they're probably gonna ask about stars, like six thousand years from now. Some like atheist guy, and oh fuck, I already decided on a really big size for the universe. I gotta speed this light up, and then oh, I'll slow yeah. it back down when it gets to close yeah, to that. It's like no. a tower defense game where you can speed up the bad guys coming. You got to that with light. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, he wipes all the sweat off of his face from saying that the speed of light is wrong, a thing that has been mathematically proven. And then he's like, OK, well, it's a big universe and a big universe would take a very powerful God. And I think we can all agree that my God is very <laughs> powerful. I said big twice. You should shut your fucking mouth. I said big. We all agree. Big <laughs> makes your thing impossible. Powerful. And then Eric, the atheist security guard, is like, I don't know. I don't know. That's crazy. Hey, Everything you just said is crazy. You don't have shoes, though. Literally. Li they distract us with the fact he's like, why aren't you wearing shoes? And then he's like, I hit you with a teddy bear. And he hits him with a teddy bear for a super okay. long time. Again, it sounds like we're just making shit up. No. We are not. You don't have shoes. I don't like shoes. I hit you with a teddy bear. That is the exact sequence of events that happens in the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, can I throw out there that the arguments are the speed of light is wrong. Uh, the Big Bang was as much of a miracle as creation is. My universe is Hi. big and big and thick. Therefore, my God is big and thick. Hit you with a teddy bear. <laughs> Hit you with a teddy bear is the best argument that this man presents to us. Yeah, okay. It seemed crazy at the time, but you're right. That was a solid close to the science argument, given what happened earlier in that science argument from... <laughs> The creationism planetarium guy. Yeah. That's rough. Okay. I do feel bad for that guy now. You're right. He had the hardest yeah, job for sure. So we watch, seriously, this guy pulls out a teddy bear and starts kind of hitting Eric Hoven with a teddy bear. For and a Eric while. Eric Hoven kind of hits back and then he gets hit again and he gets mad in real life, mm -hmm. Eric Hoven. Yeah. We watch Eric Hoven fight a teddy bear. And he fights teddy bear for a, a good a while. Minute? Minute, minute and a half. Solid minute. Solid, Solid minute. Christian minute. Absolutely. So after getting mad in real life about kind of losing that fight with a teddy bear, Eric Hovind runs out of the planetarium. And then a dinosaur furry sneaks up on him, right? Yeah. So we watch him, we watch him get chased by a dinosaur for a second. 
Right, because Night at the Museum. They're ripping off right. that movie, so that's what happens. Like, they're trying to do their homework last minute. Shit, getting chased by a dinosaur. That was in that movie. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> we spent a lot of time with the shoeless planetarium guy. <laughs> so he runs away from the dinosaur furry, and then he comes into a room, and then Jim pops back, and he's going to show Derek some dinosaur stuff now. Yeah. And he shows him Ebenezer. That's the name of one of the dinosaur fossil recreations they have. And the the whole point of this section is, okay, what about fossils? Fossils are millions of years old. They're incredibly demonstrably old. And he was like, nope, fossils. Tell me if I'm wrong here, Heath. Fossils are what happens when the whole world floods. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, you're correct. That's the narrative from creationism. Jim, the creationist guy, he's like, oh, you think fossils are millions of years old? Describe fossils right now or else the bible is true <laughs> and you watch Derek, the atheist security guard be like fuck that you're right if i can't do that the bible is true and he says because he doesn't really know he's like fossils are old leaves <laughs> mud mud and leaves right and jim's like they're not old leaves christ rose from the dead <laughs> <laughs> that's Check so hard here <laughs> yeah and that that's that's also how he describes the Great Flood. That's how we know the Great Flood happened. He says, yeah, so, well, you said fossils are from mud. You actually are kind of right about that. Mud, think about it. Mud's made of, what, water, and fossils are where? Everywhere. Everywhere. No, they're not. So, <laughs> Great Flood. If yeah. The world is one big fossil, therefore. Right. <laughs> this is also the first time he calls the Bible the history book. Of the universe. <laughs> also, I feel like we have mud now w without a great flood. I'm just saying, like, mud, we can have mud with it. It's fine. So, at this point, Jim is like, all right, well, we all agree that I'm clearly winning this argument just by a lot. So, uh, let's go ahead to the biblical archaeology section. We'll just chalk that up as one point for me. I'm not going right. to take two points. Now, let's <laughs> see how one. you do it at the biblical archaeology section. And I feel like this section was created to make the planetarium guy feel better because this section is made up of two known forgeries. Wait, are they? Yeah. Wait, wait which one? I didn't even know that. The House of David pot and then the other fake rock. That he, he mentions two fake forgeries. I Googled them and the first results for both of them are like, these are known forgeries. And then the only real thing. That's amazing. He, okay. Yes. And then the only real thing he finds is he's like, okay. So, just in case anyone Googled those two, like, fucking Dead Sea Scroll, like, like ju Junior Varsity Dead Sea Scrolls that I just mentioned, <laughs> no matter how fast I said the fucking titles, um, <laughs> geologists found Gath, and they found the word Goliath on yeah. a pot. Okay. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You're saying that's a forgery? Not the pot that has the oh. word Goliath on it? Oh, okay. Okay, because they prove nothing with this. Yeah. And I was like, oh, man, they made a forgery of something that proves nothing. That's beautiful. No, the forgeries are two, like, fucking creation museum. Like, what's that? Hobby Lobby got sold to them by an ISIS guy, like, whose hands were oh, still wet yeah. with the paint thing. Right, yeah. right, which was, like, technically, like, a, a war crime involved in the process of getting it to right, Hobby exactly. Lobby. Right, They're just two out of, of those Out of Iran or Iraq. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But now, yeah, they, they show us... A pot that had the word Goliath on it, and they think they dated the pot to the time of the story of David and Goliath. Oh, that proves oh, no, something. No. Oh, no. It's not nearly as reliable as that, Heath. No, no, no. They just found a pot from a time that had the word Goliath, and that must be a reference to the one and only Goliath of the Bible. Because what else could Why? there be? Two large people in history and or myth ever? <laughs> Come on, take it serious. <laughs> okay. They didn't even have it dated to exactly the claim in the Bible of the time of that story? No, he's like, this geologist found Gath. Which is a city yeah, that is where mentioned that was supposed to have happened yeah. in the Bible. Pause two, three, four. Also, <laughs> I feel like my brain inserted some science for yes, them just your, to help them out. Your brain inserted a reason for this to have anything to do with this museum. I don't know what my brain thought. They were like, oh, they used radiocarbon dating all of a sudden, and they thought that was real for one minute, and then they stopped again. Yeah, yeah. so. It's even worse than I thought. Amazing. Yeah. And then he, he ends up by going, and I love this so much. He goes, yeah, every time someone disproves one of these stories, we come up with another one is an argument for our side. <laughs> <laughs> 
Wow. Okay, well, sold on that argument. They're, they're done with that argument. That was the best they could do mm-hmm. with biblical archaeology. Jim snaps again, and they're back at the front desk. And Derek, we see him in dream state talking to Jim, but he's napping on the chair. So now this is where it's revealed, the spoiler that we did earlier. It's all a dream. Yeah. And so he, he wakes himself up. There's this fucking great moment where he's like, slap yourself. And he, he slaps himself kind of half-assed. And Jim's like, harder. And you see Eric Oven be like, no. And he's like, all right, we'll just keep going. I got beat up by then. a teddy bear earlier. My face hurts. <laughs> and yeah. now we watch them tour the gift shop. Yep. They go to the gift shop. <laughs> he's like, hey, you had a, a kid, right? Well, how about a 3D movie? Huh? <laughs> And I, hey, hey, does your kid like to read? And he's like, oh, he does like to read. Well, how about this book that we'll be very vague about because it's only 18 pages long, but we'll pretend it's a good novel to give your kid? And that's the end of the movie. That's the end of the movie. And then we get a credit thing. It says shot in 24 hours on a cell phone, which you probably don't want to like, believe. I believe you, Night at the Creation Museum. I definitely believe you. Don't write that down, though. <laughs> and then we meet some guy, Patrick Marsh. God, this was so sad. This is the post credit thing. Eric Hovind as himself comes on screen and he's like, you probably don't know Patrick Marsh. And I was like, no, I don't. I don't. Okay. He's a real scientist. We learn with 20 years experience at Universal Studios. Yeah. But Patrick died. Yeah. And <laughs> Eric Hovind is like, is very sad. Patrick's dying words were. Like and subscribe and donate at creation today. <laughs> smash, slash smash that like button, everybody. Yeah. Smash it. <laughs> smash it for Patrick. <laughs> yep. And that's the end of the movie. They yeah. uh oh, they show us a how to get saved strategy guide yeah. on their so website. You can get saved on the website, and we also have a Night at the Ark Encounter movie. Which Oh yeah, watch. there's a sequel. Mm-hmm. I thought okay. I thought this creation museum was the one in Ken Ham's Ark Encounter. This is a different one? <laughs> no, it's a different one. Cool. Cool. Sequel, baby. Okay, well, yeah, we've got something to look forward to then. Great. <laughs> so, uh, what do you think? You got an outro there, Chair Stealer? Yes. You got something to uh, close this out there? I do. With that uh-huh. to look forward to, and with one less museum to jerk off on, we're going to call things there for the night. Heath, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, Heath will do the outro, and then the podcast will be over. <laughs> That's how it goes, I think. Give me a chair back. Squint in the air. Stop it. God, Stop squint it. Air. Squint in the Stop it. No going limp. Squint in the air. <laughs> I'm shitting. <laughs> and that's all the blasphemy we've got for you tonight. But we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptocrat, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Monday. An even newer episode of our sister show's hot friend, God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday. And an even newer episode of our half-sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. And before we wrap it up, big thanks to all the new donors who will get some delightful compliments next time around, possibly about their intellect or their genitals or their genital intellect, potentially. And if you're feeling generous like those fine people, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, and that'll get you early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode. Or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the Donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson handles our social media. And our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. <laughs>